Hello everybody! Hello masters of your own destiny! What's going on? Welcome to my basement! I'm Francisco Suarez, your host, and this is Ron Suarez, the basement. Master of your own destiny, where are you guys going today? What is the destination? Listen, it doesn't matter the destination as long as you enjoy the process and you put the hard work. Without those two things, you will not get there, I promise you. Look what happened with us here in Francois' basement. We start with a small group of people, small followers, very hard to find experts. And now we have Grow, we have an awesome lineup of experts uh, for this new season. And we were just uh, awarded with two very prestigious awards, which I'm so happy and proud and humbled to receive. We received the International Communication Award of Excellence for Best uh, educational video podcast and we also got the PEA award of excellence for best uh, podcast so who knew I mean that is fantastic and today to celebrate these awards and to kick our new season we have a very special guest in the house John Hoffman is with us he's a director writer producer actor you name it he is an expert in the field for sure he is behind looking one of the hit TV shows in HBO where he collaborates as a writer. He has been nominated to the Primetime Emmy for his work also as a writer and collaborator for Oscars. And he now partners with Steve Martin, the famous actor and comedian, has a, a co-creator and writer of Only Murders in the Building, which is an excellent show in Hulu, which I 100% recommend. So talking about having an expert in the basement. And like I always do, I invite two students to be part of the conversation. I think, again, it's very important to do voices to the students. I have Noah Rammer with us and Morgan Delser. They are both at the Cinema and Screen Studies in SUNY of Spiegel. And they are both very fan of John work, especially with the show of Murders in the Only Murders in the Building. And they are also very interesting in visual storytelling. So I cannot wait to see what kind of questions they have for John. This is from Suarez Basement. Thank you for tuning in like you always do. Thank you for being loyal to our um, show. And thank you to WCNY in Central New York for their partnership. Let's start this episode of from Suarez Basement with Josh Hoffman. Right, here we go. Well, welcome to our show and thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. And I got to take the opportunity to introduce uh, two uh, great students uh, from our cinema studies department. And they are very excited, of course, to be here. So Noah, Morgan, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure, ladies first. <laughs> um, I'm Morgan. I am a cinema studies major um, as well as a broadcasting major. And uh, I think one of my biggest aspirations, like in the future, would be to screenwrite and produce television. Um, my real big aspiration is um, the film festival circuit. I love to um, organize and manage, um, and so I'm really looking um, into that field um, and discovering the hidden gems of uh, today's media. Well, welcome, guys. Thank you for being my co-host. I'm super excited to have you here. Uh, John. You, I mean, your curriculum is, is incredibly extensive. You are a writer, you are a director, producer, actor. You seem to be doing everything, which I don't know whether you find the time to do everything that you do. But with this, uh, I just want to ask you, how are you doing? Uh, professionally, how things going with you, especially in these crazy times that we're living in, I think it is important to have those questions. And does anything have changed based in this uh, pandemic? Thank you so much. It's such a nice introduction and questions. Uh, I, I think for right now, um, this has been such a, a tumultuous year for everybody, a year and a half uh, for everybody. And uh, doing anything has felt mm. challenging. So doing something creative has had two sides of it, which was thank God there's something we can focus on other than what's going on in the world. And then the other thing that it did was it sort of made you appreciate so much more about having, being able to do something creative, doing something that I, I kind of can't believe we're able to accomplish this show 
But for me personally, career-wise, it was kind of everything all at once, sort of the greatest time of my life professionally, um, working with an incredible group of people and simultaneously knowing that this incredible group of people were all in many ways stepping out of their homes at a very risky moment to engage in a creative endeavor that hopefully when we got it all, if we got it all, uh, that would bring a sort of spirit to the world that we all recognized in the material. Even though it's a murder mystery, there's great comedy and there's a nostalgia and there's a spirit underneath it that's very joyous. And uh, it felt like a potential antidote to uh, some particularly depressing moments and times over the last year and a half. And it seems to be hitting the world in that way. So I feel incredibly grateful to be uh, steering the ship on this one. Um, and it's it's been remarkable to get to work with these incredible talents. Well, my first question pertains to only murders in the building. So uh, it's, what is it like trying to write something that teeters between like drama and comedy and a mystery as well? Like, how do you balance all of those things in a um, efficient and like really entertaining way? Such a great question. Um, so as, uh, a screenwriter, aspiring screenwriter as yourself. Um, I had the good fortune of many years of working for studios screenwriting before I segued into television writing. So in that world, in the screenwriting world, I was both uh, lucky to work, and I was only interested in working in various way different projects from one to the next. I would get bored if I was in the same genre. So I would go from romantic comedy to a World War II epic for Warner Brothers and, and go over here and do that. And I swang pretty wide and learned the craft uh, by different genres. So that was one way that prepared me for this particular job, because in some ways, um, when I uh, met Steve Martin and he had this idea of a murder mystery set in New York. Um, my mind started going about New York, my love for New York, and the tone and making a modern show uh, that I think anymore now on streaming and, and other shows that are coming out, you wanna sort of break the mold a bit. And my first thought on that was to make a show that tonally felt like New York, uh, meaning, I often said like you can take a 10 walk block and a 10 block walk in New York and you'll see something that makes you crack up laughing. You'll see an elegant piece of old school architecture next to some modern amazing thing going up right next to it. You'll be intrigued or scared by someone who's doing something nefarious on the corner. Then all of a sudden a Broadway show will be promoting its show in the middle of the block in Times Square. And, you know, there's brassy music playing and people dancing. So all of that, I thought, could fit, if we're lucky, tonally in one show that feels like New York. Yeah, I, he uh, I heard you mention, John, just a minute ago that you said that um, Steve Martin came to you with this idea. How did that kind of collaboration come, come, come together? <laughs> got the best invite of my life from Dan Fogelman and Dan's uh, producing partner, Jess Rosenthal, uh, who had met with Steve Martin and sh Steve shared this idea of three amateur true crime uh, aficionados uh, yeah. who suddenly encounter this thing in their own New York apartment building and start to investigate. So. Immediately upon hearing that, I got very excited because I love Steve Martin. And, and they said, would you want to have dinner with him? And I said, I would love to have dinner with Steve Martin. And then I suggested a bunch of my own ideas that just, you know, a good idea will, um, I believe, feel in some way easy to write and inspire more ideas around it. So it's, it's always a, when you recognize there's some struggle or some difficult thing in the writing or a difficult thing in the concept of a show or, or concept of a film, it's a moment you may want to step back and examine the concept 
because the ones that feed you and you just can't stop thinking and more ideas flow from it, it's a good thing to go towards those. <laughs> um, and this one was like that. So his idea led me to think about how to mod modernize that a little bit more. And so I thought about the podcasting. I thought, what if this trio is in engrossed in their favorite podcaster and all of their true crime podcasts? And then what if while they're investigating in their own building, they decided to produce their own investigative podcast at the same time, which I thought could be funny. And I thought could also uh, make it sort of a meta look at our own true crime obsessions. Um, I tell my students in my script writing class for television that they are living in the second golden era of television, for sure. Uh, but they don't see themselves reflected in the idea that they can actually create something, but they seem to feel very much like, well, I, I think that's quite hard. Like how I do that, that is a question to you. What is your recommendation for any John talent writers out there that suddenly have this brilliant idea and want to actually make it into the industry? I, I couldn't agree with you more, Francisco, about, about this golden era we're in and also more opportunity for more voices, which is so necessary. Um, and I, I, I think if there's, if there's something to say, really out loud to students or people that are aspiring to do any of this in, in the world of landscape of television, that there's never been a more open door to a varying a group of voices and a need and a necessity for that. So the first thing is that impulse you get uh, confronted by with your students when you're encouraging them and saying that this idea is really good, you should develop it, it is on them to confront that part of them that says, but that's hard, mm -hmm. how do you, and all of that. I mean, we all have, we all have done that. I've done it over and over again. I do it every day. I do it every day. I sit in front of my laptop and think what's episode four. It's so hard. And, but you know, that's the thing. It's the persevering through that now, but being also clever as much as you can be. If you have an idea that, connects to you personally, that you love, that you've gotten good responses from your teacher, from, from anyone, from there's a vibe around a project like that. Uh, that's everything. That is everything. And, and someone will be interested in that. If it gets on the air, if it gets made, if it gets you the next ticket to another script or something like that, the bottom line is the hard part the part that feels like the hurdle is always going to be there. But trust in yourself, trust in the look in someone's eye when you tell them your idea and they light up and go, oh, I'd watch that. Um, you should work on that. I was going to say, because um, you, write, you write for both TV and film before. Um, so what would you say is the biggest difference between writing something like a feature length film and like a television pilot where there's like, cause like when you write for TV, there's all of this stuff. And then when there's a film, you're condensing it into two hours. What do you think is the biggest difference when coming up with those concepts and um, writing That's them out? Great question. And I find my comfort area uh, bridging those two worlds because they are very different. You know, one is its own story unto itself. The screenwriting is, is like, how do I, craft the most enveloping, magnetic story that holds you for an hour and a half and tells the full story, tells the picture that makes the whole thing come together and you leave with imprinting, hopefully, on anyone who's seen it into their memory, uh, a, a, a feeling of being in that world for an hour and a half and it just lives within them. That's the great opportunity of film, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then TV, when I segue to do TV, I started working late in my career in TV because I was always like, I like my hour and a half, two hour windows to write for. And now I'm walking into TV, but I ended up on HBO's Looking and working on that show, which was a two season show on HBO uh, about six years ago. But it was done uh, by 
sort of independent filmmakers. Uh, Andrew Haig was the showrunner of that. And he had never done TV before uh, either. So the two of us got in there with Michael Lannon who created the show and we got involved in the world of TV, but we kind of looked at each episode. Our segue in was to look at them like little independent movies. And, and that is another way, anything that makes you more comfortable uh, and more makes something more accessible opens you up to seeing how you can be a part of that world. And that was the great entree for me into TV where I thought, oh, okay, I don't have to give up my screenwriting uh, skills that I've learned. I actually just have to adapt them into an ongoing character-based um, storytelling that the key there is, is a, a concept in TV that can hold ongoing seasons potentially and characters that you just fall in love with and can peel back uh, layers of. You know, in our, in our opening uh, episode of season one and only murders in the building, there is, you know, a good murder mystery peels back the onion of all of the characters. And, and White Lotus, I think, used a similar phrasing. But um, it is really about, you want characters that you can peel back new layers and new discoveries about them over a stretch of time beyond just the hour and a half that a film might hold. Um, and that part, I think if you have whatever entry point you come at, it, whether you're a novelist or whether uh, you write theater plays, um, it's about watching yourself stretch and like taking the same things you know, but just picturing it over like taffy, stretch it out and now see, can, can this all hold? Um, I know that at the beginning of this conversation, you said that um, it was an honor to steer the ship um, on Only Murders in the Building. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is your first experience with show running, correct? Correct. Yes. So how was it um, show running versus your early days um, script writing on um, Looking? Way more exhausting. No. <laughs> yeah. I can't even yeah. tell you. I had no clue. Um, and you do, I kind of don't, that's one, an area you can't really prepare for. Um, a showrunner on a show, at least my experience here, um, you know, and, and then add in the twist of in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so, and in New York City and, and many, and with really big famous people and all of those things. So there was a lot to learn uh, on the fly, um, huge support um, and, and great support from an experienced showrunner like Dan Fogelman was hugely helpful um, and great support from our studio and our network because they loved the show and invested in the way that would give that support. And then the other thing was I had spent five or six seasons, five or six seasons, somewhere in there, uh, on Grace and Frankie right before this. And right. I had been given a lot of uh, leeway to sort of help steer a lot of that ship at various times. But I was given that by very experienced showrunners, Howard Morris and Marta Kaufman, who uh, was one of the creators of Friends. And... Um, lovely people who sort of showed me the ropes and taught me in ways that I, I, they don't even think of them as teaching me uh, because they're just doing the job and you realize sometimes you'd ask questions like why are they doing that that way why are they bringing that up and then later when I'm in the job I wrote Marta and Howard at various times throughout being a showrunner on this show and I would say boy now I get why you did that now I understand <laughs> So it was a lot of those experiences, but um, I loved it so much uh, and have loved it, you know, and it may be just a, my own personality being like, I like to be the one in charge mm. and answering the questions. But a lot of that comes from the storytelling. And I think as a screenwriter, uh, you, in order to write a screenplay, you have to know your whole world. And so that when you become a showrunner, and you're helping answer questions for your production designer, your costume designer, the actors, the cinematographer. Everyone is coming to you with the questions and you are there to answer the question. But I feel in my position, I had to be sort of 
kind of the chief guide day to day. Um, and I think it's helpful to have a single minded, like helping to shape everything so that it all feels of a piece. Um, so earlier you were talking about uh, your characters, right? And like most stories are character driven, um, especially when I write, that's what, you know, that's what you start with, right? Your characters and then your world and such. Um, I was wondering, like when telling a story with such three dimensional characters like you have in Only Murders in the Building, can it be difficult figuring out which qualities and secrets should be revealed and when? Um, like fleshing them out like slowly like you know there's this depth but you're fleshing like could that be difficult is there a certain way that you go about it a lot that's a great question and yes uh i'm not interested in characters that don't have all sides right i just think they have to be grounded but they can be funny as hell they can be you know do random things like people um i have a couple of people that I look up to in the business. One of them is like James Brooks, James L. Brooks, um, who way back in the day did a groundbreaking television show called The Mary Tyler Moore Show. And those characters were big, um, you could like draw big Sharpie lines around them. And, and you could say they would be very broad uh, in description. Um, but, but I like taking something that makes you go, wow, I know that guy. Mm. But then underneath it, create dimension, create reality and truth and, and heartbreak and pathos and, and, and other things that are part of all of our existence. So I like to think of myself as a, a humanist writer. Uh, the thing I connect to the most is the thing I recognize either in myself in a character or in someone I know in a character. How we develop the crime? Because one thing is the plot, Steve Martin going in, in his date, and, and but how we actually create a crime that seems interesting enough for the viewers to keep watching and that we don't feel, we don't lose sense of reality because that's what I think. Some, some of the crime uh, shows or research show, in some point the viewer is like, hmm, I don't believe that could happen. But with this show, each episode, you feel like, oh my God, like, yeah, I can see this happening. How, how that process work? Like, do you guys do a lot of research of police uh, crime things? Or, or I'm super curious to see how that works. I love that question because it's so hard. I'm going to tell you right now, talk about a hurdle like your students will tell you right off the bat. Like, it's not your typical half hour comedy that we're writing here. Right. Um, and I've never been so jealous of actual true crime podcasters before um, because <laughs> this, it's as though, like, you know, when you have an actual murder case, you have facts. You have, I like to think of it like if there's photographs, say you've got 10 photographs of an actual, that represent bits of a one actual murder case. Well, podcasters, once they have those 10 photographs of the actual thing that exists in the world, it's just about arranging which photograph gets shared first, which photograph. Gets. So you create a mystery about like, now we're gonna focus on the victim for this one episode. Now we're gonna focus on this aspect before this aspect, but it makes people think this way. So it's about the arrangement of the actual facts. In our case, we're crafting the entire thing out of nothing. Right. So. This, and, and we're now deep in season two, we start shooting in a month. Um, and so we're deep in season two's very intricate mystery. The writer's room is, uh, they're all absolutely brilliant, lovely people. And all of them say, this is really tough at times because we have to start at the end. Um, I have known the identity of the killer early on uh, enough before the writer's room opens in each season, which is very helpful. And you begin at the end and then you twist your way there. Mm -hmm. um, hiding, obviously, the killer in various ways, creating red herrings, creating blocks. Creating, but you really, the break 
uh, and that's a term someone, Steve Martin, just asked me yesterday, why do they call it breaking story? Um, and I'm like, I don't know why they call it that, but it's the breaks of these episodes don't occur until we have, and it's many months into our first writer's room discussions. It takes us many months to figure out that mystery track from back from end of season up to where do we begin? And that's only after months that we go, okay, what's episode one? Now what's episode two? How do we shake that up and make that? And, but we at least have the track of understanding of all the twists and all the things we have, the marks we have to hit. Um, but it is very challenging, but backwards to forwards is my way of dealing with that mystery. I want to give you the opportunity. Uh, I do this video podcast because I am in love of being a professor. I love all my students at Dearly. I, think I'm I feel like they're lucky to have you just by getting this conversation with you. I'm just thrilled that there's someone in the world being a teacher for the next generation. I well, feel somebody have to do it. <laughs> no, but, yeah, <laughs> no, but I, listen, I, that is the point. I want my students to see themselves reflecting in experts like you, in people that were sitting in a classroom, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and, and they were dreaming about telling stories and to be able to make it into the industry, right? We all were there. So more than I can put my students in situations like these ones, that they have the opportunity to talk to experts like you, the better. So it's my love for education, but also my love for storytelling that I have this video podcast. Uh, I would love to give you the opportunity to, to give a final message to the students and all those out there that are more in, like me in love with the idea of educating and also uh, storytelling. Boy, and thank you for this. And thanks for the opportunity to talk to you and your students about this. Because I, I, I think if there's one thing I would say, it's I go back to when I was starting out um, and I was an actor, as I said, um, and I didn't write. I was scared of writing because I respected writers too much. And they felt over there. They felt like too far off. And it felt like an opportunity that was too challenging. And I wasn't born to it in some way. Like you're supposed to be born to something. But um, I found that there was an access point just in my own quiet way that if I could push through, as I say, the sort of hurdles that you can create for yourself, uh, all the reasons that seem to make a lot of sense as to why you can't do something or it's meant for someone else to do, um, it, it does require tapping into a belief and a, and a trust in yourself and trying mm -hmm. and getting help and being brave enough to reach out to people uh, who can say, you, I see something in you, come here if you want more. And that's a teacher or that's whomever, but ultimately you have it within yourself. Um, and, and if you believe it, and if you want, I love meeting Noah and Morgan here too, because it seems so clear to me that you're already on the path of knowing what you want to do. Um, you were very clear in describing what you want to do. That is a gift. Landing on the thing you are interested in the most and heading toward it. So many people hang in a moment of indecision for so long. And that is a huge gift. And go, 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 fly, fly toward it. <laughs>